Does creatine cause hair loss? This is a common question that we get because we are starting to use creatine more and more as more and more literature comes out. But this question has been around for actually decades and it really stemmed from a 2009 study that started the conversation and it keeps coming up over and over and over again. So in today's video, I want to settle for all of you that are concerned about this, whether or not creatine is likely to cause hair loss according to the literature. We're gonna dive into what is really the only human study on the topic. We're gonna to talk about the details of dihydrotestosterone, DHT, testosterone, and we're gonna compare that to some, we'll call it more updated literature uh, over the last couple of years that has, I think, helped to clear the air around this confusion of does creatine cause hair loss? So if you're on creatine, you're worried about your hair or you're thinking about creatine, this video is for you. Now, before I get started, if you are on creatine or if you are using creatine and you have a story about your hair, I do wanna hear about it because while the literature is very compelling, I also love to hear what's happening out there in real life. So leave us a comment here on YouTube. And lastly, while you're dropping that comment, please click that subscribe button. Turns out less than half of the people that consume this content are actually subscribed to the channel. The reason why that matters is not for me, but for our mission to educate that osteoporosis is both reversible in many people, but definitely preventable. The more people that subscribe to this channel, the more we can get that message in front of the world, which we desperately need to do. So thank you for your help. So what is creatine? Well, many of you have probably heard creatine being talked about. It's becoming a very popular supplement, not only in the bodybuilding and, and health space, but now more so in the, the menopause, perimenopause, women's health space, because we're learning more and more of the potential benefits. So what is this thing? Well, creatine is a naturally occurring compound found in muscles, it's found in the brain. It's made from a couple of specific amino acids. One of the most important things that creatine does is to act as what's called a, a phosphate donor. I'll explain what that means. But it's a phosphate donor for energy production. You've probably heard of ATP or adenosine triphosphate. ATP is what our body uses to make energy very quickly. So if we're doing high intensity things like jumping, sprinting, you know, running for our lives, we burn ATP first. In fact, if you consider sort of a hierarchy of energy metabolism, you have ATP and then you have glycogen breakdown using glucose for energy and then you have fat burn. And so ATP happens very quickly, but you run out very quickly. So when you're using ATP, what your body's really doing is just breaking it apart. And it's breaking ATP into ADP, and then your body has to then add a phosphate on and make it back into ATP so that can then break it down again. And this happens you know, millions and millions of times, probably a second. And the, the P part, the phosphate part, has to come from a donor, and creatine is that donor. This is why you see most of it in your muscles, because this is where you're burning a ton of energy. And you can also see it in other cells, like in nerve cells. This is why it has potential for brain health, cognitive function, et cetera. So creatine has a massive impact on your energy, production, but therefore on how you feel, how you perform. What's interesting about creatine is that as you age, we make less of it, just like so many things as we age. So then when it comes to maintaining our muscles, maintaining our performance, maintaining our mental function, adding things back that we're no longer making as efficiently can be really helpful and creatine fits into this. Now creatine has been studied so extensively and we will definitely talk about that. But some of the general things that we see with, with creatine is improved performance, particularly muscular performance, improved muscle mass, improved body composition, cognitive function, mood, et cetera. So creatine has a lot of potential benefits, but there is this persistent thing that comes with creatine, which is that a lot of women are concerned that it's gonna cause their hair to fall out. Why would that be? Well, turns out that this study from 2009 that I mentioned earlier has been repeated and rinsed and washed and put back on the internet over and over and over again. So let's talk about this 2009 trial because while I understand what their, the theory is here, Let's talk about why this isn't really something that we need to worry about. So if we go back and look at this 2009 trial, we looked it up, we pulled the study, read the details. So here's what they did. This is in a population of young men in rugby players. They used a loading dose of creatine of 25 grams per day for a week. Now this is really common in the bodybuilding space, or at least it used to be. 
And we don't really do this or recommend this anymore because we found that you just don't need it. But after the loading dose, you go to five grams per day. So if we're not doing the loading dose, this is kind of becomes irrelevant anyway. But anyway, the study was only for three weeks. And what they did is they measured hormone levels. They measured specifically dihydrotestosterone. Now, dihydrotestosterone is the active form of testosterone that gets converted from free testosterone to DHT. DHT or dihydrotestosterone is an issue when it comes to hair loss, and we'll describe that. But if you look at these numbers, it looks really convincing because they say in the study that there was an increase in DHT of 56% during the loading phase, and then it dropped, but it was still 40% above baseline after 21 days. So how is that relevant when it comes to hair loss? Well, it turns out that DHT is a well-known contributor to male pattern baldness. Believe me, I should know. But DHT does result in shrinking of hair follicles, especially in those that are genetically susceptible to this. And this includes both men and women. The mechanism involves the enzyme, if you've heard of it, 5-alpha reductase, you may have heard of drugs like finasteride or dutasteride. These are drugs that leverage that enzyme as a way to block the conversion of testosterone to DHT. But here's the funny thing about this study. It didn't measure hair loss. It didn't even talk about hair loss. It only measured hormone levels. It measured both total testosterone and free testosterone. And it turns out that those levels actually didn't go up. So always remember when we look at studies, the details of the study matter. If you dig into the data on this, you see that the baseline DHT levels in the active group or the, the intervention group were significantly lower than in the placebo group. So what does that mean? Well, when you look at averages or reference ranges. We've talked about this before where you know you're just looking at, you're looking at the statistical averages, right? So when something comes in significantly lower than another group that in theory should be the same, one of the things that can happen is that you just happen to catch this group when it was lower. This is a statistical swing in one direction. So what happens when you have something that is not for any particular reason lower than the average, it'll always lean then towards the average or it'll head towards the mean. And so when we see something like this in a study, this is why we compare the two groups. It's expected then that this would head towards the mean or head towards the average because it started out away from the average. And that's exactly what we see here. Additionally, the absolute increases were quite small. So remember when we talk about relative changes versus absolute changes in literature. Most studies will report a relative change because relative changes are bigger numbers. It looks impressive, but is it clinically relevant? An absolute change is the actual change. And so if you look at the uh, increase in DHT, for example, in the creatine group, it went up by about 0.55 nanomoles per liter. So what the heck does that mean? Well, in the placebo group, it went down by 0.17 nanomoles per liter initially. Now, this change is statistically significant, but if you consider what the average is, which is between one and three, that's the reference range in nanomoles per liter for DHT, actually, this is a very small change and it's all within the range of normal. So what actually happened here? Well, it turns out that the rugby players in the creatine group probably were just happened to be caught with lower DHT levels at the time of the initial study. And then we retest later and they are heading towards the mean or leaning towards the mean, which just means that that's gonna come up. The placebo group was higher than average and it was coming down because everything is going to average out over time. So that's probably what explains this. Some of the things to consider here is that these are young men. These are rugby players. Increases in DHT could also be due to changes in, in activity, changes in exercise, resistance training, diet, sleep, all of these different things, as well as other potential things they could have been exposed to. So that's why a study like this needs to be taken with a grain of salt and it needs to be repeated. So fortunately, the second study I have is a 2021 review that really puts this together for us with more recent literature. Before we get there though, if you are struggling to put together your own bone health journey and you haven't been to our masterclass, please join our masterclass. This is an opportunity for you to hear me go through the top five mistakes that we see people make on their bone health journey that is preventing them from successfully reversing osteoporosis. I would love to time collapse your journey, help you speed your way to success by showing you what these mistakes are. If you haven't been to our masterclass, look for the link 
in the description on YouTube. All right, so let's go to this review paper because it actually answers a ton of questions. I'm only gonna focus on the, the hair loss question, but they talk about in this paper, 12 studies looking at DHT, looking at hair loss and creatine, and only one of them, that same 2009 trial, showed that there was a potential for hair loss because of the increase in DHT. And in fact, none of the others actually even showed changes in DHT or testosterone or free testosterone. And again, none of these studies actually measured hair loss. So here's the truth. If you're genetically predisposed to male pattern baldness, high DHT levels could theoretically accelerate the process. But for most people, creatine is not gonna be the problem because again, no other study has showed that creatine increases DHT. There's actually pretty much zero direct evidence linking creatine to hair loss. Remember that hair loss is a multifactorial thing. Stress, thyroid dysfunction, nutrient deficiencies, hormonal shifts, all of these things play a role. Creatine is really unlikely to be the variable at cause here. All right, so I know this was a quick one, but I wanted to get this out there because again, we hear this all the time and I'm always looking to educate so that we can empower you on your journey in bone health. And if creatine is working well for you, but you're worried about hair loss, I think you can chalk up the hair loss likely to something else and you can keep taking the creatine if it's working well for you. So that's it for today. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.